Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we'll be discussing Book 1, Chapter 3 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Test this to be the up. best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books, and we'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. And since we are kind of just getting going here, I'm going to work really hard to keep this spoiler-free as possible. Uh, it's, uh, it's always kind of easy here at the beginning, but it does get harder. <laughs> I'm the reverse. It's hard for me because there's so much I want to talk about. I get that. <laughs> Today's episode contains topics not suitable for young listeners. Discretion is advised. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Last week, I had referenced a dungeons and dragons parody skit by a comedy troupe i went and looked those audio clips up because i wanted to listen to them again the comedy troupe are the dead ale wives i did include the links to the youtube videos in our episode description last week i will do so again this week i highly recommend that you listen to them they're only about 10 minutes long absolutely hilarious they are billy you hadn't heard them before what were your thoughts? I thought it was funny. There is some truth to it for us uh, D&D players, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, chapter three. Shallow ridges ribboned the hillsides a league north of Pale, barely healed scars of a time when the city attempted to devour the steppes bordering the Reavy Plain. Since memories began, the hills had been sacred to the Reavy. Pale's farmers had paid for their temerity with blood, yet the land was slow to heal. Few of the ancient menhirs, boulder rings, and flat stone crypts remained in place. All that was sacred in these hills was held so only within the minds of the Reavi. The Maib thought, as in faith, so we are in truth. She drew the antelope hide closer about her thin, bony shoulders. She felt new pains and aches this morning, evidence that the child had drawn more from her in the night just past. The old woman told herself she felt no resentment. Such needs could not be circumvented, and time was growing short, so very short. She watched the child scampering over the weathered terraces. A mother's instincts ever abided. It was not right to curse them, to lash out at the bindings of love that came from the division of flesh. For all the flaws raging within her, and for all the twisted demands woven into her daughter, the Maib could not, would not, spin webs of hate. Nonetheless, the withering of her body weakened the gifts of the heart to which she so desperately clung. Less than a season passed, she had been a young woman, not yet wedded. She had been proud, unwilling to accept the marriage proposals of numerous young, virile men and bind herself to marriage. The Reavi were a damaged people. How could one think of a husband and family in this time of endless, devastating war? She was not as blind as her sister kin. She did not embrace the supposed spirit-blessed duty to produce sons to feed into the ground before the reaper's plow. Her mother had been a reader of bones, gifted with the ability to hold the people's entire repository of memories, every lineage reaching back to the dying spirit's tear. And her father had held the spear of war, first against the white-faced Bargas, then against the Malazan Empire. This fatalistic view of the world sounds a lot like what the youth of today is feeling. I hear a lot of people saying they don't want to bring kids into this world because their outlook on the future is so dim. Yeah, it does sound very similar. And I, I'm sure this viewpoint rears its ugly head every so often in civilizations. Wouldn't you think so? That especially civilizations that are growing big. Yes. I think it's part of the life cycle of a civilization. Yeah. There's a chaotic time. And then out of that, something new emerges. You build that up. There's a time of prosperity. And then the people that it took, we've talked about this before, when the memory of the people yeah, that yeah, have. to build it dies out and nobody has lived the experience of building something or going through that time, mm -hmm. that's when yes. the, the mistakes start coming in and then you oh, yeah, start sure. going down the same roads you shouldn't be going down. Yeah. I feel like we're on that bottom half, bottom of that, of that wheel again, don't you? The very, very bottom of it. I'm hoping we're going to come up. Yeah, the interesting thing about it is a lot of people see that it's happening 
they know the cycle. Do we have the ability to turn it around is the big question. Because knowing what we know now, we have access to more information. I say that maybe scholars of the past also had this information as well. I don't know. But yeah. it seems like maybe we can hopefully do something. That's the optimistic I, I, viewpoint. I, I, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're like, I love how you have that little, you're just like me. I'm like, maybe we can. Well, I mean, I have so, kids. I have so, to hope. Hey, we can. I've been doing a lot of praying here, brother. Hey, I'm praying. I'm praying. As a Christian, we're told to pray and we're told to pray for our leaders. And it doesn't matter if we like them or not, we're told to pray for them. So I pray for the leadership of this country always. Mm. It's not just our country too. It's it's happening all over the place. No, I pray for the world, dude. I pray for the world. The world's crazy, man. <laughs> the world's pretty crazy right now. I had another thought here. The Mibe's mother being the repository of memories. That sounds a bit like the Bene Gesserit from Dune, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I agree very much. The Mibe missed both of her parents deeply, yet understood how their deaths and her own defiance of accepting a man's touch had together conspired to make her the ideal choice in the eyes of the host of spirits. An untethered vessel, a vessel in which to place two shattered souls, one beyond death and the other held back from death through ancient sorceries, two identities braided together, a vessel that would be used to feed the unnatural child thus created. Among the Rivi who traveled with the herds and raised no walls of stone or brick, such a container, intended for a singular use after which it would be discarded, was called a Maib. And so she had found herself a new name, and now every truth of her life was held within it. And that's such a tough break for this young lady, even though she's outwardly old. I'm really impressed with her ability not to resent the child feeding off of her life force as it grows. Yeah, I agree. I can't remember. Well, we, I'm hoping the answer to this is, that, I don't know if it's spelled out or not. Did she volunteer for this role or was it just uh, picked out by the spirits? I think she was chosen. I don't think she volunteered. Okay, there we go. And there's a part of me that I just realized this is a little bit similar to postpartum depression. She's fighting it off. But that whole depression that comes after having a child, this is kind of a, a amplified version of that where the child is literally feeding yeah. off her life force, but she's really doing her best to fight off feeling any negativity towards the child. Yes. And I'm assuming she's got a heck of a support system among these uh, other folks here in the Reavy. I don't know. I'm hoping so. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. The Mibe thought, old without wisdom weathered without the gift of years yet i am expected to guide this child this creature who gains a season with every one i lose for whom weaning will mean my death look at her now playing the games a child would play she smiles all unknowing of the price her existence her growth demands of me and that is a pretty wild concept the parasitic relationship between the mother and the child here yeah and it's a wild sounding concept but it sounds what makes it sound more horrific is because there is a touch of truth to it. And that does make it more horrific sounding. A touch of truth, how? Uh, well, in a way, a child who is breastfeeding from their mother, in a way, is feeding from their mother. And so while not technically parasitic or anything like that, there is a impression there that there is that to it. That, and when you when you put it like a parasitic thing like with her and between her and the child it takes something that's natural and adds a layer of horror to it i was thinking similarly but from a different perspective so when the child's growing in the mother's body it demands a huge amount from the mother yes i thought of this as if it never stopped she may have been birthed but those demands okay. continued after she was outside the body of the host and it's accelerating too it sounds like yeah <laughs> that's well said well said, sir. But it's interesting. We came to a similar conclusion from how we looked at it. Yeah. The Mibe heard footsteps behind her, and a moment later, a tall, tist Andy woman arrived. The newcomer's angled eyes held on the child playing on the hillside. Fine, scaled armor glinted from beneath her black-dyed, rawhide shirt. The woman murmured, deceptive, is she not? The Mibe sighed, then nodded. The woman said, hardly a thing to generate fear or be the focus of searing arguments. The Mibe asked, there have been more then? The woman said, aye. Kalor renews his assault. The Mib stiffened. She looked up at the Tistandi and asked, and has there been a change, Corlat? Quick reminder here, Corlat was one of the Tistandi dragons that flew with Solana to attack Raced on his approach to Darujistan. Mm. Okay. Corlat said, brood remains steadfast. If he has doubts, he hides them well. 
the Maib said, he has, yet his need for the Revi and our herds outweighs them still. This is calculation, not faith. Will such need remain once an alliance with the one-armed Malazan is fashioned? Corlat said, it is hoped that the Malazans will possess more knowledge of the child's origins. The Maib said, enough to alleviate the potential threat? You must make Brood understand, Corlat, that what the two souls once were is nothing to what they have become. She was created within the influence of a Talani mass. Its timeless warren became the binding threads, and were so woven by an Imas bonecaster, a bonecaster of flesh and blood, Corlat. This child belongs to the Talani mass. She may well be clothed in the flesh of a Revi, and she may well contain the souls of two Malazan mages, but she is now a soul taken, and more, a bonecaster, and even these truths but brush the edges of what she will become. Tell me, what need have the immortal Talani mass for a flesh and blood bonecaster? And that's a new wrinkle. A living Talan Imas bonecaster that wasn't born as a Talan Imas. <laughs> that's very intriguing. I'm cu- Were there bonecasters before they, the ritual? Yes, in the prologue. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Fran Cole, they hadn't gone to the ritual yet. They were about to go, and he was flesh and blood at the time. That's and right. Fran Cole was the that's same right. bonecaster that was there to oversee the transfer of the souls into the Maib. Okay, very good. Because I was kind of curious. It's an intriguing concept. I, I guess this bone. Ca- I, sometimes I just need these regiments, these titles spelled out from the you know the groups that they are, kind of what they are. You know, like okay, here we have the Talan. I'm, I need a D and D book <laughs> <laughs> for the world of Malazan. Don't you? You know, we need the races. We need the races book here. You know, I forget exactly what it was called, but you know, the monster manual. Yeah. Basically, your monster manual. Yeah, I thought there was one about races too, but I'd be, everything would be wrapped up in there. But yeah, the races are generally in the core rule book. Okay, you know what would be so sick if they came out with a rule book, a written rule book for this. Oh my god! Oh, <laughs> that would be fantastic. I would run a campaign for sure. I would join you somehow. Zoom, I guess. Oh yeah, <laughs> I would have to be part of that. You ready to go to Seven Cities, Billy? Oh, absolutely, dude. <laughs> Is that where we would start in Seven Cities, I'm assuming? Why ever leave? <laughs> <laughs> the desert calls her. <laughs> Corlat's grimace was wry. She said, I'm not the person to ask. The Maib said, nor are the Malazans. Corlat said, are you certain of that? Did not the Talani mass march under the Malazan banners? The Maib said, yet they do so no longer, Corlat. What hidden breach exists between them now? What secret motives might lie beneath all that the Malazans advise? We have no way of guessing, have we? Corlat said, I imagine Caladan Brood is aware of such possibilities. In any case, you may witness and partake in these matters, Maib. The Malazan contingent approaches, and the warlord seeks your presence at the parlay. The Maib turned about. Caladan Brood's encampment stretched out before her, precisely organized as usual. Mercenary elements to the west, the Tist Andy holding the center, and her own Revi camps and the Bedouin herds to the east. The march had been a long one, at one point following the south-wending old Revi trail crossing the plain that was the Revi's traditional home. She thought, a home torn apart by years of war, of marching armies and the incendiaries of the Maranth falling from the sky, quarrels whirling in black-specked silence, horror descending on our camps, our sacred herds. Yet now we are to clasp wrists with our enemy, with the Malazan invaders and the cold-blooded Maranth. We are to weave braids of marriage, our two armies, jaws locked on one another's throats for so long, but a marriage not in the name of peace. No, these warriors now seek another enemy, a new enemy. I can't imagine how the Revi would combat the airborne Maranth. Seems like they would be at such a disadvantage. It's really asymmetrical. Yeah, and I'm like you. I have no idea how that would even work. I mean, the only indications that we've been shown that, that I recall about the Reavies, they're planes dwelling, so no nomadic type of folks. And I'm assuming spear and bow. And we saw them use spears against Perrin. I mean, I, so, I mean, again, like you said, airborne guys dropping grenades on you. I mean, <laughs> how does that even work? Yeah, I imagine they're extremely fast because dragonflies are frighteningly fast. Yeah. I would think the only way to be able to combat something like that would be some type of hook shot or net that takes out the wings of the quarrels, but yeah. they could just fly higher than they can shoot. I don't know. It seems like it would be a nightmare to try and deal with that. Yeah, I can't imagine. 
the attrition must have been bad. I don't think the Reavy have a choice, do they? No, they really wouldn't have any choice. It's their homeland. They're being invaded. Well, are they being invaded or are they being passed through as the Maranth were fighting with Pale? Well, it sounded like they were being attacked. So if the veteran herds are feeding Caladan Brood's army, then presumably they were trying to destroy some of that food so that the army wouldn't have the supplies it needed. Okay. Beyond Brood's army to the south rose the recently mended walls of Pale, the stains of violence a chilling reminder of Malazan sorceries. A knot of riders had just departed from the city's north gate, an unmarked gray banner announcing their outlawry for all to see as they slowly rode across the bare killing ground toward Brood's encampment. The Mibe's gaze narrowed suspiciously on that pennant as she thought, Old woman, your fears are a curse. Think not of mistrust. Think not of the horrors visited upon us by these once invaders. Dujek Onearm and his host have been outlawed by the hated Empress. One campaign has ended, a new one begins. Spirits below, shall we ever see an end to war? The child joined the two women. The Mibe glanced down at her, saw within the steady, unwavering eyes of the girl a knowledge and wisdom that seemed born of millennia. And perhaps it was indeed so. She thought, here we three stand, for all to see, a child of ten or eleven years, a woman of youthful visage with unhuman eyes, and a bent old woman. And it is, in every detail, an illusion, for what lies within us is reversed. I am the child. The Tist Andy has known thousands of years of life, and the girl, hundreds of thousands. I thought this was a really interesting choice, to have their life experiences misaligned with their outward appearances. It is. I like that. Do you think this is a take on the three fates? Do you know what I'm talking about? The three crones? Is that from the Odyssey? I know it's old mythology. I'm not sure from where the, they come from exactly, but I think it's yeah, Greek probably mythology where the, you have the, uh, they're the fates and they, one of them, I forget how it works. One spins the thread of life. One of them cuts it, determining your length. And I forget what the other one does. I guess the other one is the actual, uh, it's weaving your life into something or and, uh, or you're being woven into the tapestry, or the but they they control your fate somehow. I don't know. I'm just always kind of curious if it's kind of just a take on it. I never can tell. With Erickson, we know his interest is on anthropology and archaeology. I'm assuming he's consumed tons of mythology in his readings. I imagine so. <laughs> Corlett had also looked down at the child. She smiled and asked, "Did you enjoy your play, Silver Fox?" Silver Fox said, "For a time, but I grew sad." Corlat's brows rose. She asked, and why is that? Silver Fox said, there was once a sacred trust here, between these hills and spirits of the Reavy. It is now broken. The spirits were not but untethered vessels of loss and pain. The hills will not heal. The Mibe felt her blood turn to ice. Increasingly, the child was revealing a sensitivity to rival the wisest shoulder woman among the tribes. Yet there was a certain coolness to that sensitivity, as if a hidden intent lay behind every compassionate word. She asked, can nothing be done, daughter? Silver Fox shrugged and said, it is no longer necessary. The Mibe thought, such is now. She asked, what do you mean? Silver Fox smiled up at the Mibe and said, if we are to witness the parlay, mother, we'd best hurry. That is not an answer. That sounds like she's avoiding answering. <laughs> yes, it does. Very Jedi. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> The place of meeting was 30 paces beyond the outermost pickets, situated on a low rise. The recent barrows that had been raised to dispose of the dead after the fall of Pale were visible to the west. The Mibe wondered if those countless victims now watched from afar the scene unfolding before her. She thought, spirits are born of spilled blood, after all. And without propitiation, they often twist into inimical forces, plagued by nightmare visions and filled with spite. Is it only the Reavy who know these truths? From war to alliance, how would such ghosts look upon this? Beside her, Silver Fox said, They feel betrayed. I will answer them, mother. She reached out to take the Mibe's hand as they walked and said, This is a time for memories. Ancient memories and recent memories. The Mibe asked, And you, daughter, are you the bridge between the two? Silver Fox said, You are wise, mother, despite your own lack of faith in yourself. The hidden is slowly revealed. Look on these once enemies. You fight in your mind, raising up all the differences between us. You struggle to hold on to your dislike, your hatred of them, for that is what is familiar. Memories are the foundations of such hatred. But mother, memories hold another truth, a secret one, and that is all that we have experienced, yes? 
I had this highlighted from a previous read through. I thought it was an important thing to consider if you are holding generational grudges, you know, <laughs> evaluate things at this time. I agree. <laughs> I like when I find the things I have highlighted. This book doesn't have so many highlights as it does definitions. <laughs> this one wasn't as bad as Garden's because I had to, I wrote a bunch of definitions just so I remember what he when he was using all that terms. It's been relatively tame lately. I haven't had any crepuscular. Yes. Haven't had any ochre. Mine was men here's. It's men here's. You know, I almost laughed when I said that because I was talking about <laughs> the caverns and creatures stuff. That was one of the things they were making fun of the DM about that pissed him off because they were making lewd jokes about men here. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Because I was like, men here. That's my first word I have highlighted in this book was not crepuscular, it was men here. Because okay. I think crepuscular was using gardens once or twice. So it was men here. I'm like, men here. Is that like a tomb or something like that? I was like, yeah. It was, but I write it down because that's how I remember things. I retype it in there to go, okay, I'll remember it this time for sure. I was driving around at twilight last night and I saw two different cats running around and I was like, <laughs> man, they're crepuscular. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, 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 what? Yes, they are. That's, it's enough. Uh, that's all you can say. Like, oh, blimey, they're crepuscular. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny to see them out at that time. Now I have a word for it. You know? <laughs> well, when they're crepuscular outings. Yeah. Biting back irritation, the mime nodded and said, so our elders tell us, daughter. Silver Fox said, experiences. They are what we share. From opposite sides, perhaps. But they are the same. The same. The mime said, I know this, Silver Fox. Blame is meaningless. We are all pulled as tides are pulled by an unseen, implacable will. Silver Fox's hand tightened as she said, then asked Corlat mother what her memories tell her. Glancing over at the Tistandi, the Mai raised her brows and said, You have been listening, yet saying nothing. What reply does my daughter expect from you? Corlat's smile was wistful. She said, Experiences are the same between your two armies, indeed. But also, across the breadth of time, among all who possess memories, whether an individual or a people, life's lessons are ever the same lessons. Corlat's now violet eyes rested on Silver Fox. She said, even among the Talani mass, is this what you are telling us, child? Silver Fox shrugged and said, in all that is to come, think on forgiveness. Hold to it, but know too that it must not always be freely given. Silver Fox swung her sleepy gaze to Corlat and the dark eyes suddenly hardened. She said, sometimes forgiveness must be denied. What are your thoughts on that sentiment? Are there situations where forgiveness should be denied. I am a Christian and I don't believe that forgiveness be can be denied, but justice can't be denied either. And these are not exclusive things. Am I making sense of the fact that yes, I can forgive someone, but I, I also believe they should face justice. Okay. But let me ask you this justice. I get, but the burden is on you to forgive them. Imagine the most horrific thing that could happen to you or someone you love. The burdens mm -hmm. on you to forgive the person for doing it, say it was malicious. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, through yep. some neglectful act, you know, like drunk driving or something like that. Right. So sure. Mm -hmm. How do you process that? Dude, it just, I mean, again, I just have, you have to do a lot of praying and it's, it's not easy. I have had something happen to me with uh, my late missus and her kids. That was very, where, you know, I had some very hard feelings toward them over some things they did to us. And it took me a long time to let it go. But I, you have to, you know, basically, I, I have come to this conclusion. Well, as a Christian, I have to be, I have to forgive to be forgiven. I mean, that's just kind of one of the rules. But number two, before I was a Christian, I came to the conclusion I got to forgive because it's going to eat me alive. Because if I don't forgive people personally, all I do is hold on to anger. And it's not, it's not anger, it's hatred. It's active animosity and hatred. And with that, it does nothing but eat me alive. I can't deal with that. I mean, I just couldn't, I had to let it go. You just have to let it go. So and you have to forgive to let go. I at least what if justice never occurs? Do you think you could let it go? Justice? Yes, I'd ha I, I think I have to. Mm. I, 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 are you asking me if it's hard? Because I because justice wasn't done on this scenario in which I was. It was because it involved court and other things. And justice was indeed not served in what happened. So you have to let it go. Yes, because <laughs> it just still kills you. Because there comes a point where it's like it just don't matter. It just don't matter. Let it go or it's going to kill you. And that's kind of, you got to come to come to that because it, because it, it will, 
or if it doesn't kill you, it's going to make your life miserable. So here's the thing. I guess for me, I have never had anything happen to me so bad that I'm in a position to have to go through that. But thinking on that, like how I would react, I don't know. You're right. It would be eating you alive, but also like the injustice that happened. I think the anger would just be there always. You know what I mean? Like to, to forgive the person yeah. and they never had justice. I don't know. I, it, for me, it just seems like a really difficult thing to try to deal with. It ain't easy. <laughs> It's yeah. most surely not an easy thing. I mean, this is, of course, just my opinion. And, and it's not even my opinion. As far as a, being a Christian, I have to, you know, you've got to forgive. I think it's beneficial for you psychologically to forgive, you know, um, even if justice is not served. I thought you might say that. That's the, I wanted to ask you because <laughs> I thought that's what your answer was going to be. I'm glad I'm consistent. Now, I, and I have not faced, you know, there's people that have been through so much, much, much worse. I can't imagine. I know how hard it was for me to let things go. I can't imagine how someone who's been done way worse than me would feel. I have no idea. I recently saw a video. I think it was a clip from Dr. Phil. He had this lady on and this man, when she was younger on the subway in New York, she was abducted by an individual and assaulted. And then she identified the man that got convicted but then come to find out later, he was exonerated because it wasn't his DNA. And then she admitted that she knew it wasn't him later on the show. Wow. So the guy spent 20 some odd years in jail. Wow. She is now asking his forgiveness, saying she knew it wasn't him, but she testified that it was. And he forgave her. And I was like, man, this dude right wow. here, I don't know if I could, knowing you're innocent and yeah. her coming and telling you that she, I, you, you sympathize with her from the perspective that she went through something horrific, but it's yes. not right what she did to him. And so Absolutely I was trying to, trying to think of it from his perspective. I was like, man, I don't know if I had the strength to do, to just, he, he must've done all his processing while he was in jail and probably. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was an African American yeah. gentleman. I'm assuming he was Christian. And I was like, man, this, yeah, he must've thought about this a lot and been prepared. Yeah. Oh yeah. Forever years ago. Jail's a lot of time to think. Yeah. That's rough, man. Mm, that's bad. That's yeah. real bad. Silence followed. The Mibe thought, Dear spirits, guide us. This child frightens me. Indeed, I can understand Kalor, and that is more worrying than anything else. They came to a halt far to one side of the place of parley, just beyond the pickets of Brood's encampment. Moments later, the Malazans reached the rise. There were four of them. The Mibe had no difficulty in recognizing Dujek, the now renegade High Fist. The one-armed man was older than she had expected, however, and he sat in the saddle of his roan gelding as would a man pained with old aches and stiff bones. He was thin, of average height, wearing plain armor and an undecorated standard-issue short sword strapped to his belt. His narrow hatchet face was beardless, displaying a lifetime of battle scars. He wore no helmet, the only indication of rank being his long gray cape and its silver wrought fastening. Real quick, I wonder if any of those scars on his face came from Bolt. I know Bolt's horse took his arm. Yeah. Kind of makes you wonder. Maybe some of those other cuts on his face came from that, too. Could very well be from that fight. Yeah, that's right. R.I.P. Bolt. R.I.P. Bolt. Man, what a great guy. Uncle. <laughs> At Dujek's left side rode another officer, gray-bearded and solidly built. A visored helm with a chain camel disguised much of his features, but the Mibe sensed in him an immeasurable strength of will. He sat straight in his saddle, though she noted that his left leg was held awkwardly, the boot not in the stirrup. The chain of his calf-length hauberk was battered and ribboned with leather stitches. That he sat on Dujek's unprotected left side was not lost on the Mibe. To Dujek's right sat a young man, evidently an aide of some sort. He was nondescript, yet she saw that his eyes roved ceaselessly, taking in details of all that he saw. It was this man who held the outlawry pennon in one leather-gloved hand. The fourth rider was a black Maranth, entirely encased in chitinous armor, and that armor was badly damaged. The warrior had lost all four fingers of his right hand, yet he continued to wear what was left of his gauntlet. Countless sword slashes marred the gleaming black armor. This last guy intrigues me. We don't know nearly enough about him. Yeah, I agree, especially because the Maranth are so intriguing because they're always armored up, you know? It's kind of like the Mandalorians, you know? <laughs> What's going on under there? What, uh -huh. Who are you fellows? That is a great comparison. <laughs> I never thought about it until now. <laughs> you really don't get much insight into them at all until 
late in the Esselmont books. And even then, it's not a lot. No. I've had a romantic encounter with one, but it was not told <laughs> and from Esselmont. <laughs> I've already been sure that was a woman. What is, how did you know? <laughs> I forget which book it was, but there's a comment made about He's something that she that she didn't even take the armor off when they were in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was joking, but I can't remember what it, I can't. I think it's book four or return. It's the Esselmont. It was real funny though. Mm -hmm. Was that Orb Scepter Throne? I think that might have been it. Yeah, it was really enjoy. Like I said, I really enjoyed what I've been reading of the Esselmont stuff, but I just can't. I, and I, I really, like I said, I remember exactly where I am, but I bogged down where I am. I think you were in Blood and Bone. If I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's where I am. I'm in blood and bone. I'm yeah. on Jakaruku. I'm, I'm bogged yep. down in the jungles. Yeah. Yep. That was a slog. I'm mired in the jungle, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what I imagined Vietnam would be like. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. Dude. Reading it was like being <laughs> in Vietnam. Corlat grunted softly beside her. That's a hard bitten lot, wouldn't you say? <laughs> the Mibe nodded and said, Who is that on Dujek One Arms Left? Corlat gave a wry smile as she said, Whiskey Jack, I would imagine. Cuts quite a figure, doesn't he? For a moment, the Mibe felt like the young woman that she was in truth. She wrinkled her nose and said, Reevee aren't that hairy, thank the spirits. Corlat said, even so. <laughs> the Mibe said, aye, even so. And the Bachelor Malazan edition starts. <laughs> Joking aside, <laughs> it's funny to get this perspective on Whiskey Jack. Thus far, we've largely seen him presented from a leadership and soldiering perspective. Right. To get the female side of it is certainly different. You know, I forgot that the ladies here thought that he was pretty easy on the eyes. I imagine it's like a rugged lumberjack-ish thing where he sure. he's bearded and he looks very capable. If George Clooney really was as rugged as he looked when he looked at rugged and rugged roles, or Brad Pitt. Well, I don't, I've never pictured George Clooney as rugged. Brad Pitt, the character he played in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he looked pretty yeah. beefed up for that. He was rugged in Fury. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty rugged. In the, he's rugged looking at that. So What a role, man. I need to see that. That's a good movie. I need to see I that. I love again. that That's movie. It is good. so good. It's so ominous. The soundtrack on that <laughs> it is. is a great soundtrack. It really sets the tone of that movie well. Yes, it does. Silver Fox spoke. I would like him for an uncle. The two women looked down at her in surprise. The Mib asked, an uncle? Silver Fox nodded and said, you can trust him. While the one-armed old man is hiding something, well, no, they both are, and it's the same secret, yet I trust the bearded one anyway. The Maranth, he laughs inside, always laughs. And no one knows this. Not a cruel laugh, but one filled with sorrow. And the one with the banner. Silver Fox frowned and said, I am uncertain of him. I think I always have been. That wording is suspicious. Uncertain of him and always has been. Yeah, always has been. That's a very strange turn of phrase, wouldn't you say? Makes it sound like she knew him in the past. Yes, it does. The Mibe met Corlat's eyes over Silver Fox's head. Corlat said, I suggest we move closer. As they approached the rise, two figures emerged from the picket line, followed by an outrider bearing a penniless standard, all on foot. Seeing them, the Mibe wondered what the Malazans would make of the two warriors in the lead. There was Bargas blood in Caladan Brood, reflected in his tall, hulking form and his wide, flat face. And something else besides, something not quite human. The man was huge, well-matched to the iron hammer strapped to his back. He and Dujic had been dueling on this continent for over 12 years, a clash of wills that had seen more than a score pitched battles and as many sieges. Both soldiers had faced dire odds more than once, yet had come through, bloodied but alive. They had long since taken the measure of the other on fields of battle, but now, finally, they were about to come face to face. Can you imagine meeting your enemy of 12 years? Would they be built up in your head, or would you have their measure by then, you think? I would like to think that what we know of one arm and what we will come to learn of Brood, I think that they've got a pretty good measure of, theirs, of each other. I wonder what they think each other look like in advance that's a good question i was thinking about it from the perspective of people have never seen us on video so they don't know what we look like and right. after listening to us for several years we might do a, a live stream one day or something and then they're gonna be like these people look right. nothing like what i, I thought they'd look like <laughs> i know it i know it so i was thinking well you know like they say i got a face i got a face built for radio <laughs>
So I was thinking, I wonder if it's similar. Granted, they know each other because they've fought each other and they know how they're going to react in situations for twelve. Right. But actually right. meeting each other, I guess Dujek probably has likely seen some historical texts about what Caladan Brood looks like. And Dujek is named Dujek One Arm. So it's like, okay, that's kind of descriptive. Maybe that's enough. Right, right. The guy with the one arm, I'm sure that's Dujek. <laughs> And I'm assuming that between these guys, they have some of the finest intelligence agencies amongst themselves on the planet. So I'm assuming they have a pretty good knowledge of what they kind of look like before. At Brood's side strode Kalor, tall, gaunt, and gray. His full-length surcoat of chain glittered in the morning's diffuse light. A plain bastard sword hung from the iron rings of his harness, swinging in time with his heavy steps. If any player in this deadly game had remained a mystery to the Mibe, it was the self-named High King. Indeed, all the Mibe could be certain of was Kalor's hatred of Silver Fox, a hatred bred of fear, and perhaps a knowledge that Kalor alone possessed, a knowledge he was unwilling to share with anyone. Kalor claimed to have lived through millennia, claimed to have once ruled an empire that he himself had finally destroyed, for reasons he would not reveal. Yet he was not an ascendant. His longevity probably came from alchemies and was anything but perfect, for his face and body were as ravaged as those of a mortal man who was nearing a century of life. Again, what a character. To live life as he does, he's truly cursed. You know, I have really conflicting images of Kalor. You know, I, I know he's very old, but he's obviously powerful. But, I, you know, a, a, amongst this crew, is he powerful? Is he just... I, 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 I don't know. Compared to normal humans, I know he's really powerful, but I don't know. I really have a hard time with this old boy and images of him other than him feeling old and decrepit here. And sometimes it's like, is that a put on? No, I don't think he looks feeble. He definitely looks weathered okay. and rough. So if right. you think he's right. gaunt and gray, I picture him as having long gray hair. His face is pocked. He's scarred up, sunken cheeks, doesn't look yeah. healthy. But he looks very weathered. I don't think he looks incapable, though. Okay. I was just kind of curious because I'm, I'm like you. I, just, I, I know he's not incapable, but I'm just kind of uh, – I've always so – not enough is said about him. And what's said about him is either a lot or nothing at all. And mostly it's coming from his own mouth. <laughs> <laughs> he does like to go on. Calor doesn't like when you talk about Calor. You know, he'll tell you about that, too, apparently. <laughs> at length. <laughs> Brood made use of Kalor's knowledge of tactics, was seemed an instinctive mastery of the sweep and shift of vast campaigns, but for the High King it was clear to all that such contests were but passing games, attended to with distraction and barely veiled disinterest. Kalor commanded no loyalty among the soldiers. Grudging respect was all the man achieved, and, the Mibe suspected, all he ever had achieved, or ever would. And that's quite the contrast to Dujek or Whiskey Jack given what we know of how their soldiers respond to them. Is that why Calor said all the time in the immortal words of Rodney Dangerfield, this can't get no respect, can't get no respect. At this point, I think the curse is in full swing. He's had yeah. 160,000 odd years to be cursed and be miserable. Prior to that, I think he was just sociopathic. Right. He doesn't care about anybody. There are means to an end for him. I guess since he doesn't care about people, you're generally not going to get Respect is going to come through fear instead of loyalty. Yes. This is a question that's an odd one here. Do you think that may be one of the benefits of ascendancy over this curse is that with ascendancy, you may at least have a little bit of, you know, joy left in life. <laughs> Whereas Calor, this is, it's the thrill is gone. There ain't never going to be no thrill, but I'm stuck with it. The curse is he'll never succeed and everything he builds will turn to ashes. That's true. Okay. Wow. It's almost like, why build anything? Because it's just going to fail anyway. Yeah. Very intriguing. Maybe he did a couple times, and then he said, you know what? I'm done. I'll just go be a mercenary or something. Right. Keller's expression now, as he and Brood reached the rise, revealed disdain and contempt as he regarded Dujek, Whiskey Jack, and the Maranth commander. It would be a struggle not to take offense, yet all three Malazans seemed to be ignoring Kalor as they dismounted, their attention fixed unwaveringly on Caladan Brood. Dujek one arm stepped forward and said, Greetings, Warlord. Permit me to introduce my modest contingent. Second in command, Whiskey Jack. Artanthos, my present standard bearer, and the leader of the Black Maranth, whose title translates into something like Achievant, and whose name is entirely unpronounceable. 
Dujek grinned over at the armored figure and said, since he shook hands with a Reavy spirit up in Black Dog Forest, we've taken to calling him Twist. That's one of those spirits you don't want to mess around with. Terrifying thought to lose parts of yourself. Yeah, that's a really horrifying thought. I wonder what he was doing. Black Dog, is that where all the... I mean, we never know. I want, an, I want a series on Black Dog or a book on Black Dog. It sounds like it was a nightmare campaign. It's the Vietnam. Yes. <laughs> the yeah. Vietnam. It was the Vietnam in the Molasses universe is what it sounds like. Yes. If you thought it was a bad slog in that in Jakaruku, this is a bad one. It's like, wow. Yeah, the insurgents really gave him trouble in Black Dog, for <laughs> sure. We'll learn more yes. about them. <laughs> Silver Fox murmured, Artanthos. He's not used that name in a long time, nor is he as he appears. Corlat whispered, if an illusion, then it is masterful. I sense nothing untowards. Silver Fox nodded and said, the prairie airs rejuvenated him. The Mibe asked, who is he, daughter? Silver Fox said, a chimera, in truth. Erickson's setting out enticing appetizers of info here, but I'm not getting a main course. <laughs> nope. It's just enough to just, I can't, it's just making me want to scratch it bad and I can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Between the info about Twist and then this stuff going on with Artanthos, I was just like, man, he's got me wanting more. And this whole chapter's riddled with this stuff. Like these little, it's like, dude, will you just speak your mind and quit just dropping these little crumbs? <laughs> You're the one that said it was easy at the beginning of the book. I lied, sir. I lied, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Following Dujek's words, Brood grunted and said, at my side is Kalor, my second in command. On behalf of the Tistandia's Corlat, of the Reavi, the Maib and her young charge. Bearing what's left of my standard is Outrider Herlikel. Dujek frowned and asked, where's the Crimson Guard? Brood said, Prince Kaz, Davor, and his forces are attending to internal matters for the moment, High Fist. They will not be joining our efforts against the Panyan Daman. Dujek muttered, too bad. Brood shrugged and said, auxiliary units have been assembled to replace them. A Saltoan horse regiment, four clans of the Bargast, a mercenary company from one Eye Cat, and another from Mott. Whiskey Jack seemed to choke. He coughed, then shook his head. He asked, that wouldn't be the Mott Irregulars, Warlord, would it? <laughs> Brood smile revealed filed teeth. He said, aye, you've some experience with them, haven't you, Commander? <laughs> when you soldiered among the bridge burners. Whiskey Jack said, they were a handful, though not just in a fight. They spent most of their time stealing our supplies, then running away, as I recall. Kalor said, a talent for logistics, we called it. In other words, very skilled thieves is what it sounds like. Is this their version of the bridge burners? Another person's logistics is another person's loss, you know? I don't think you can compare these guys to the bridge burners, given what we learned I, I, later. I we can't say more, but I, I, mean, I know. <laughs> well, this is true. <laughs> Nobody compares to the bridge burners, sir. Brood said to Dujek, I trust that the arrangements with Darujistan's council have proved satisfactory. Dujek said, They have, Warlord. Their donations have allowed us to fulfill our resupply <laughs> needs. Brood said, I believe a delegation is on its way from Darujistan and should be here in a short while. Should you require additional assistance? Dujek said, generous of them. Brood said, the command tent awaits us. There are details that need to be discussed. Dujek said, as you say, warlord, we have battled one another for a long time. I look forward to fighting side by side for a change. Let us hope the Panyan Daman proves a worthy foe. Brood grimaced, but not too worthy. Dujek grinned and said, granted. Still standing slightly apart with Corlat and the Mibe, Silver Fox smiled and spoke quietly. So we have it. They have locked gazes, taken the measure of the other, and both are pleased. Corlat faintly shook her head as she said, a remarkable alliance this, to so easily relinquish so much. The Mibe said, pragmatic soldiers are the most frightening among the people whom I have known in my short life. Silver Fox laughed low in her throat and said, and you doubt your own wisdom, mother. That would be uncanny coming from a girl this age. Again, going back to Dune, this is very Aaliyah-like in her demeanor. Yes, very much like that. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And then, of course, you can't say Aaliyah without saying, for he is the Kwisak Haderach. <laughs> I always think of this stuff she says, but in the first, in the original 84, when about to her grandfather, she called Baron Harkonnen and her grandfather. It's real frightening. Something about the way she says it's real scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a good casting and terrifying. Yeah. That little girl in particular is actually a doctor now. A medical doctor. <laughs> yeah, I think you mentioned that before. It's weird the paths people take. You never it, know where you're going to end up. I do nothing like what I went to school for back in the day. 
you know. Right. I forgot that you went for mechanic and, and that's why I forget and that explains why you're always working on your own cars. You're able to. My father was a mechanic. I have no I, I'm a musician. <laughs> I have no mechanical ability whatsoever. <laughs> I grew up working on cars with my dad. I've always been obsessed with cars, even from childhood. Books, okay. magazines, reading everything I could. Just love them. I don't particularly enjoy working on them that much because most of the time I'm doing maintenance stuff and not the fun stuff, you know? (laughs) Right. (laughs) You don't have the money to hot rod it. You just have the money to fix up what you break. (laughs) Yes. Caladan Brood's command tent was situated in the center of the Tistandi encampment. Though she had visited it many times and had acquired some familiarity with the Tistandi, the Maib was once again struck by the sense of strangeness as she strode with the others into their midst. Antiquity and pathos were twin breaths filling the aisles and pathways between the high-peaked, narrow tents. There was little in the way of conversation among the few tall, dark-clothed figures they passed, nor was any particular attention accorded Brood and his entourage. Even Corlat, Anamander Rake's second-in-command, received but scant notice. It was difficult for the Maib to understand. A people plagued by indifference, an apathy that made even the efforts of civil discourse too much to contemplate. There were secret tragedies in the long, tortured past of the Tistandi, wounds that would never heal. Even suffering, the Reavi had come to realize, was capable of becoming a way of life. To then extend such an existence from decades into centuries, then into millennia, still brought home to the Maib a dull shock of horror. They seemed to be waiting, an eternal expectation that never failed to send shivers through the Maib. And worse, she knew their capabilities. She had seen them draw blades in anger, then wield them with appalling efficiency, and she had seen their sorcery. Among humans, cold indifference was often manifested in acts of brutal cruelty, was often the true visage of evil, if such a thing existed, but the Tistandi had yet to reveal such wanton acts. They fought at Brood's command, for a cause not their own, and those few of them who were killed on such occasions were simply left on the ground. It had fallen to the Reavi to retrieve those bodies, to treat them in the Reavi way, and to mourn their passing. The Tistandi looked upon such efforts without expression, as if bemused by the attention accorded to a mere corpse. This really paints such a sad picture for the Tistandi. The fact that they aren't talking or joking amongst each other is so strange to me. It is, and part one of when you were just going through that, part of me that kind of stood out was the fact that some of this could also just be from bad blood, but... They don't care enough to do anything about it, but they just, what part of it's kind of, what's to say? I mean, you've known each other for (laughs) 20, 30,000 years. Like, holy crap. I can't talk to this guy about the way they're going to crap. Here comes John. I'm sure there's a joke about marriage in here. (laughs) Oh yeah. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of jokes, but it's like, oh my God. Yeah. 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 It's like, oh golly, not this guy. He just, oh. I just can't stand when he does it with his t- when he clicks his tongue like that. I just want to kill him. He's been doing yeah. it for the past thirty thousand years, and he does it to annoy me. I know he does it just to annoy me. Imagine if you hated the sound someone made while they're eating, and you had to eat next to them for three thousand years. <laughs> 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 or they made some weird noise when they swallowed, or just any of the idiosyncrasies yeah, that exactly. people have that annoy them. Yes. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's not even three thousand years. It's like. 50 to 100,000 years. <laughs> Is there no getting out of the military for these folks? Are you, it's like, man, you're in, you are in. Baby. I, I think they don't have anything else they could do. They're just doing it because it's habit right. at this point. Yes. It's what everybody else is doing. There's nothing better to do. Might as well. There's nothing. It's habit. It's inertia. They're just following the inertia. It's a sad existence. Yeah. Nothing to live for. That reminds me of that quote. Some people die when they're 25, but aren't buried until they're 75. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have that on my team's message at work. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm sure there's something in there about <laughs> just selling your soul to a corporation. <laughs> oh. The command tent waited directly ahead. It had once belonged to the Crimson Guard and had been left on a rubbish heap before outrider Hurlikel had come to rescue it for Brood. As with the standard, Brood wasn't much for proud accoutrement. I like that. No ostentatious display. Brood seems like a really cool guy. Yeah. And let's just take a moment here to acknowledge that both commanders here and their lack of ostentatious displays. Both are obviously extremely capable. And they seem to like each other. And that's pretty stinking cool. (laughs) Yeah. Given that they fought each other for 12 years, 
I'm sure there's an element of mutual respect at this point. Yeah. The large flap at the entrance had been tied back. Atop the front support pole sat a great raven, head cocked towards the group, beak open as if in silent laughter. The Mibe's thin lips quirked into a half smile upon seeing Crone. Anamander Rake's favored servant had taken to hounding Caladan Brood, offering incessant advice like a conscious twisted awry. Crone had tested Brood's patience more than once. The Mibe thought, yet Brood tolerates her in the same way he tolerates Anamander Rake himself. Uneasy allies. The tales all agree that Brood and Rake have worked side by side for a long, long time. Yet is there trust between them? That particular relationship is a hard one to understand, with layers upon layers of complexity and ambiguity, all the more confusing for Crone's <laughs> dubious role in providing the bridge between the two warriors. Crone screamed, Dujack one arm! The outburst followed by a mad cackle. She went on, Whiskey Jack, I bring greetings from one Baruch, an alchemist in Darujistan, and from my master, Anamander Rake, Lord of Moonspawn, Knight of High House Darkness, <laughs> son of Mother Dark herself. I convey to you his, no, not greeting as such, not greeting, but amusement. Yes, amusement. Dujek frowned and asked, and what so amuses your master, bird? Crone shrieked, bird? I am Crone, the unchallenged matriarch of Moonspawn's cacophonous vast murder of kin. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey Jack grunted, matriarch to the great ravens. You speak for them all, do you? I'd accept that. Hood knows you're loud enough. <laughs> Crone shouted, upstart, Dujek one arm. My master's amusement is beyond explanation. Dujek interrupted, meaning you don't know. Crone said, outrageous audacity. Show respect, mortal, else I choose your carcass to feed on when the day comes. <laughs> Dujek said, You'd likely break your beak on my hide, Crone, but you're welcome to it when that moment arrives. Brood growled. <laughs> nice. Do you still have that beak strap, Hurlikel? <laughs> Hurlikel said, I do, sir. Crone hissed, ducking her head and half raising her vast wings. She said, don't you dare, Ox. Repeat that affront at your peril. <laughs> Repeat it. He must have done it in the past. I missed that part. <laughs> At least once, you know, <laughs> at, at, at least once. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Brood said, then hold your tongue. He faced the others and waved them to the entrance. Crone perched over everyone, bobbed her head as each soldier strode beneath her. When it was the Mibe's turn, Crone chuckled. The child in your hand is about to surprise us all, old woman. The Mibe paused and said, what do you sense, old crow? Crone laughed in silence before replying. Imminence, dearest clay pot, and not else. Greetings, child Silver Fox. Silver Fox studied Crone for a moment, then said, Hello, Crone. I had not before realized that your kin were born of the rotting flesh of a... Crone shrieked, Silence! Such knowledge should never be spoken. You must learn to remain silent, child, for your own safety. Silver Fox smiled and said, For yours, you mean. Crone said, In this instance, I, I'll not deny it. Yet listen to this wise old creature before stepping into this tent, child. There are those waiting within who will view the extent of your awareness, should you be foolish enough to reveal it as the deadliest threat. Revelations could mean your death, and know this, you are not yet able to protect yourself, nor can the Mibe, whom I cherish and love, hope to defend you. Hers is not a violent power. You will both need protectors, do you understand? Her smile unperturbed, Silver Fox nodded. The Mibe's hand tightened instinctively around her daughters, even as the tumult of emotions assailed her. She was not blind to the threats to Silver Fox and herself, nor was she unaware of the powers burgeoning within the child. She thought, but I sense no power within me, violent or otherwise. Though spoken with affection, Crone named me Clay Pot in truth, and all that it once protected is no longer within me, but standing here, exposed and vulnerable at my side. She glanced up at Crone one last time as Silver Fox led her inside. She met Crone's black, glittering eyes and thought, love and cherish me, do you, Crow? Bless you for that. The command tent's central chamber was dominated by a large map table of rough-hewn wood, warped and misshapen as if cobbled together by a drunken carpenter. As the Mibe and Silver Fox entered, Whiskey Jack, helmet unstrapped and under one arm, was laughing, his eyes fixed upon the table. Shaking his head, he said, You bastard, warlord. Brood was frowning at the object of Whiskey Jack's attention. He said, Ah, I'll grant you, it's not pretty. Whiskey Jack said, That's because Fiddler and Hedge made the damn thing, in Mott Wood. Brood asked, who are Fiddler and Hedge? Whiskey Jack said, my two sappers, when I was commanding the Ninth Squad, they'd organized one of their notorious card games using the Deck of Dragons and needed a surface on which to play it. A hundred fellow bridge burners had gathered for the game, despite the fact that we were under constant attack, not to mention bogged down in the middle of a swamp. 
The game was interrupted by a pitch battle. We were overrun, then driven back. Then we retook the position, all of which consumed maybe a bell, and lo, someone had walked off with a 200-pound table in the meantime. <laughs> you should have heard the sappers cursing. Man, I tell you what, oh. this is the stuff of legends right here. Yes. This always stands out to me, uh, uh, well, because this is where we, uh, where, we, where we really start hearing about these bridge burners. I think this is where the legend really starts right here, where we start hearing the past a little bit here and there. That's great. Caladan Brood crossed his arms, still frowning at the table. After a few moments, he grunted, a donation from the Mott Irregulars. It has served me well. My uh, compliments to your sappers. I can have it returned. Whiskey Jack said, no. No need, Warlord. It seemed he was about to say something more, something important, but then he simply shook his head. A soft gasp from Silver Fox startled the Mibe. She looked down, brows raised questioningly, but the girl's attention was swinging from the table to Whiskey Jack, then back again. A small smile on her lips. She suddenly said, Uncle Whiskey Jack. All eyes turned to Silver Fox, who blithely continued. Those sappers and their games, they cheat, don't they? <laughs> Whiskey Jack scowled. Not an accusation I'd recommend you repeat, especially if there's any bridge burners around, lass. A lot of coins gone one way and one way only in those <laughs> games. Did Fit and Hedge cheat? They made their rules so complicated no one could tell one way or the other. So, to answer you, I don't know. His scowl was deepening as he studied Silver Fox, as if the man was growing troubled by something. I forgot that Fiddler's penchant for playing... <laughs> His card games with the deck of dragons was mentioned so early. They did it once before, I thought. Did they already do the game? Okay, I couldn't remember if they did. They it. did a game okay. once before. Oh, that's right. Okay, they did gardens. That's right. I believe so, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm thinking of a later one. <laughs> say no more, sir. I will say no more. The Mibe thought something like a sense of familiarity. Realization dawned within the Mibe as she thought, of course, he knows nothing about her, about what she is, what she was. It's their first meeting as far as he's concerned. Yes, she called him uncle, and more, there's that voice, throaty, knowing. He knows not the child, but the woman she once was. Everyone waited for Silver Fox to say more, to offer explanation. Instead, she simply walked up to the table and slowly ran her hand across his battered surface. A fleeting smile crossed her features. Then she pulled close one of the mismatched chairs and sat down. All right, we're going to stop here, and we will finish out the chapter next week. Mm. Good spot. For standout moments. Learning that Silver Fox is feeding off of the life force of the Mibe is really tough. Yeah, that's a sad thing there. I'm feeling really bad for the Mibe. Agreed. Corlat and the Mibe checking out Whiskey Jack. That Dude, was interesting. That's great. That's great stuff. I didn't even, I, I completely forgot that. That's great stuff. Silver Fox's comments on Artanthos. I would like to know more. I agree. This is a... I really do agree. I, I, I like it. He gets so vague on some of this stuff. I'm like, oh, I know he'll tell us. He's got to tell us. He wouldn't be hinting at this without telling us, would he? <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Whiskey Jack almost choking when he heard the Mott Irregulars <laughs> were in brood forces. <laughs> love yeah, that. Dude, I love I cannot wait till we meet some of the Motts. Oh, mm -hmm. good gracious. I enjoyed getting glimpses into what Silver Fox can into it simply by watching people. Do you think that's a Bonecaster thing or is that a Silver Fox thing? I don't know. She's such a complex milieu yeah, of nice. <laughs> different things nice. that it's hard to know where anything's coming from. Yeah, I agree. And another thing I kind of enjoyed also was, I don't know why this kind of touched me and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the fact that Crone, something about Crone's sweetness to the mibe is an intriguing thing for me it, it's it paints crone in a different light for me it does that kindness towards the mibe yeah especially seeing what she's going through it almost hints at some compassion doesn't it very much it's and it's very unexpected i think i think that's why it strikes me because I, I we know nothing about crone we what little we know is from gardens and we just know she's a powerful creature of some sort that is a crow but other than that i got no idea about her and she, but she struck me as kind of cold. Now here, this this gives her a, some kind of warmth to her, very much so. A mother, well, she maybe it's a mother to mother thing. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of Crone, I enjoyed Whiskey Jack and Dujack smack talking <laughs> Crone. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff, man. Really good stuff there. Yeah, and then Cherry on top is Brood threatening to strap Crone's beak closed <laughs> again. Again, not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> again, yes. <laughs> And then finally, oh. the story behind Brood's map table. Oh. Core memory. Legendary. Yes, yes. I agree. The, the, the table is a core memory for me for sure. 
All right, great job tonight, Billy. Hey, great episode, man. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? I just like all the continued intros as in the, here early in the book is that these people, especially these folks like Dujack, Meat and Brood, who, you know, we've known Dujack from guards. We kind of, you know, you saw him, we've interacted with him a few times. He said some things, you know, some of my favorite lines, he'll pick up that sword, you know, think, is that in a puddle of water? Or kind of <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those, those remarks like that. So we've gotten to know Dujack and love him and respect him. But I thought we would have a similar like of Brood if we ever got to meet him. And here we are, and I, and I like Brood so far. So I just love it. What I remember of Brood from Gardens of the Moon, I liked him then as well. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing to dislike. So I like that we're now kind of these guys. I like it because they're getting together. It's like, okay, now we're getting together because we got we to gotta join together. That's a, uh, It's mm. like, yes. Yes. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.